Sri Dr. Wan Aziza, President of Parti Keadilan Rakyat or Keadilan. Friends on the panel, Dr. Farouk Musa representing Versailles 2.0 today. Tommy Thomas, lawyer and constitutional expert. Ibrahim Sufyan from Merdeka Center for Opinion Research. And Dr. Ong Ken Ming, DAP election strategist. Azru Azwa and Yin Shao Lung, my friends and colleagues from Institute Rakyat, members of the media and friends. A very warm welcome to all of you here. Thank you for spending your evening on a very rainy night, braving the traffic jam to come here. Um, we would like to welcome, Institute Rakyat would like to welcome you to our second in our public series of forums tonight named GE13, Elections A to Z and the Role of a Caretaker Government. Maybe just to tell you a little bit about Institute Rakyat and what we do, uh, for those who are new to us, I uh, thank you for joining us. Institute Rakyat is a very new baby. It's only been formed a month ago. It's a Parti Keadilan Rakyat affiliated think tank that seeks to formulate independent policy analysis and research and seeks to present these policy research and analysis in the form of reports to the party and to the public. Um, if you look at the brochures that are on your chair, today we aim to conduct research. Um, we hope to do a lot of public discourse, things like this, so that we can interact with people like yourselves, with civil society, experts, academics, uh, on a range of issues. And finally, we also have a youth hub. So if any of you have youth children or friends, you can also invite them to join us as we seek to connect with the younger generation. Now, the inspiration for the forum tonight, of course, is, is an obvious one. Um, but when we heard that Parliament was dissolved on the 3rd of April, we felt the need to conduct something that would not just talk about the election outcome. That's the million dollar question that everyone wants to know. But we also felt it was very important for the Malaysian public to know the processes involved in the elections. And the very complex nature of this particular election, which will involve a very hotly contested uh, debate between the Barisan National and the Pakatan Rakyat, uh, some of the questions that we put forward today, and my colleague uh, Yin Shao who will be moderating the session, will bring you through these, are things like what happens in the event of a hung parliament? What is the responsibility of a caretaker of government? Because this is what uh, we currently have. Barisan National is a caretaker government. What are, the, what are the laws and regulations that govern the elections? What has the election commission done as a result of the, the parliamentary select committee? What is the impact of the voter rolls? And uh, I'd like to announce fellow panelist YB Elizabeth Law. YB Elizabeth Wong is currently the caretaker member of the caretaker Selangor government. So we will welcome her to join us. So I hope you will enjoy the discourse that we have with us tonight. Um, it's going to be a very interesting evening. And so without further ado, I would like first of all to welcome Dr. Sri Dr. Wan Aziza Wan Ismail for the welcoming address. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome her. Yang Berhormat Elizabeth Wong, Saudara Dr. Farouk, Saudara Ibrahim Sufian, Saudara Ong Kiam Min, Saudara Azul, Saudara Yin Shalom, Tuan-tuan, um, Puan-tuan yang berhormat sekalian, Assalamualaikum dan Salam Sejahtera. Terima kasih dan uh, pada malam ini menjemput saya dan kita berada di ambang lebaran baru di pusada politik negara kita yang tercinta ini. Thank you for inviting me this evening. Yesterday, the Election Commission finally made an announcement the whole country has been waiting for for almost two years. After much hesitation and from a very nervous government, we now stand on the brink 
of one of the most important and monumental elections in Malaysia's history. 23 days. 23 days till the 13th general election. Today we decide what we want our country to be and what it uh, we want it to look like in 5, 10 years down the line. We will look back in history the 5th of May 2013 as the day Malaysians finally summoned their courage to change their 55 year old government shop. Friends, Malaysia has been called a nation obsessed with elections. It is true, especially over the last two years, we have, that we have been entirely preoccupied with any matter related to the electoral process and outcome. In particular, due to the tremendous efforts of a certain yellow-themed movement, I wear yellow tonight, per se 2.0 towards free and fair elections cannot be underscored on this count, a movement led by a fellow woman who has earned my utmost respect. <laughs> to Amiga. But more serious is the question of why exactly there has been such emotional fervor surrounding the elections. An election is supposed to be only one such method of demonstrating democracy, after all. In theory, a citizen of a country ought to have the ability to express his or herself through a number of means, for instance, community participation in decision-making, transparent access to accounts and government information, and minority rights being visibly impactful. However, it is precisely because we do not have these channels made available to us to exercise our rights as conscious, conscientious Malaysians that the general election is one of the only means when we go to the polling booth once every four to five years or so. And even on this call, we do not fare that well. Friends, Tonight, we have with us prominent figures, lawyers, politicians, experts, I must add, doctors. Because Dr. Farouk and me, we are doctors, so we are included. Who will help us navigate the complexities of an electoral process. I am particularly concerned with the issue of the role of a responsible caretaker government. <laughs> the Attorney General's chambers recently stated that it could not draft legal guidelines to outline the role of a caretaker government. Worse, our caretaker information minister said that an interim government has the right to use government machinery as long as campaigning for an election <coughs> has not started. And already, the caretaker Prime Minister Dr. Sri Najib Toraza has announced 8 billion worth of projects in Cyberjaya. This is a gross contravention of the principle that they are merely holding office in care of and in trust of the next elected government. There should not be major policy decisions, contracts or new promises that involve financial commitments because they may not be able to deliver on these promises. The money is no longer theirs to spend, nor the property theirs to use. For example, the Pakata Rakyat leaders in Slango and Penang have returned their cars, their official cars, and we hope Barisan National would do the same. But we're still waiting. Friends, nevertheless, the question on all our minds, I'm sure, is whether or not there is a chance that the government will change hands. Electrical, electoral fraud not intended, there is something only you, the voters, can decide. We as politicians and potential future leaders of the country can only persuade with the hope 
of making a convincing enough argument, especially for the critically minded urban dwellers such as yourselves. The second question you may ask is that how exactly would a coalition of many visions come together to form a cohesive government? My response to you is yes, it is a marriage, but not one born out of sheer convenience. A marriage is one of shared ideals, a shared life, but probably our partnership is actually more of a shared appearance of arrogance and abuse of power, pervasive corruption and mismanagement. All three parties have chosen to be partners with each other, actively chosen, and this commitment is similarly fleshed out in the form of working out our partnership together. Although there may be, there may have been controversies, these have eventually been sorted out through the process of discourse, much in the way that we are doing tonight at this forum, as well as through the recognition of equal partnership. Friends, whilst there are differences amongst Malaysians, it is common values that bring us together. From different backgrounds, ethnicities and religions, notice I do not use the word race because we are of only one race, the human race. Remember that because it has been stuck in my memory. So, common values of peace, social and economic justice, democracy, liberty, equal, equal opportunity for all alike. These are the values that say we are not happier with the way things have been going on in this country. For far too long, we have tolerated rampant corruption, incredulously low standards of public education, a rise in crime levels. We must not tolerate a country where only the rich are permitted the luxury of contracts, safety and good education. Friends, and I consider you are my friends, because we have journeyed together over the last tumultuous decade. Fifth May is the day we are all waiting for. Don't forget to vote, please. On this day, Malaysians, young and old, will go to the polling booth to decide on the fate of the nation's future. I urge you to join me in choosing wisely, to uphold the principles we have but forgotten swept aside in the tide of greed, corruption, and blind self-ambition at the expense of our children. In 1998, the year was of personal awakening to me, for I was awakened. I was quite complacent. My life was quite uh, taken for granted. I had been a wife, <coughs> deputy prime minister, and it was in the magazines that I know I'll be the next prime minister. But it was not meant to be Mungkin Kalini. Let 2013 be the year of reckoning for us all. Over the next three years, uh, over the next three weeks, you will be witness to all sorts of shenanigans and let us stay cool and calm as we do our individual duties together. The political process ultimately is one of procedure as we collectively line up to mark our crosses on the balance. As some of us quietly sit as polling and counting agents. These are important because in certain places you have a price on your head polling and counting agents can be bought in some places. So let us hang on to our, to our um, promise. We want to make change for our country. 
and as yet others carefully observe and monitor what takes place in the surrounding areas, ensuring no untoward incidents, no foreigners take our vote and steal our future. I thank you for joining me in this historical journey and for sharing with us our party and our coalition. The struggle towards making Malaysia a better place to live, work and play in. I thank the caretaker Prime Minister Najib for promising a peaceful transition should there be a change in government because I for one believe that there will be a change greeting us inshallah, God willing. And when that happens, I assure you that we will work hard to make it, to make sure it is successful and a stable transition. We will work with you and with governing bodies, the private sector and the NGOs to achieve a smooth transition of power. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Wan Aliza, for your speech that commits to a peaceful and smooth transition. And that's something that I certainly hope all of us will look forward to. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move to the meaty part of the evening, talking about numbers and figures, and I'm glad that we're all going to be a bit of, uh, of a nerd tonight. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panel once again to you, uh, starting from my extreme right, um, Ibrahim Sufyan, or more fondly known as Ben, to many of us. Um, he heads the Merdeka Research Center for Opinion, Merdeka Center for Opinion Research has been um, the prime mover of political polling in the country, so you can ask him questions on that. And next we have Dr. Ahmad Farouk Musa, also a <coughs> friend, um, who is tonight representing Mersey 2.0, uh, but he also heads a very prominent NGO called IRF, the Islamic Renaissance Front. YB Elizabeth Wong. Um, no stranger to the civil society movement, has been involved in NGO work for a long, long time until she was elected uh, into the Selangor government and is, as I said earlier, the caretaker member of the Selangor Exco in charge of environment and consumer affairs and tourism. Um, in the, on, my, on my right, um, we have Dr. Ong Ken Ming, who is um, up to recently, uh, he was independent, but he joined the DAP and is now the election strategist for the Democratic Action Party. Um, he's going to present some interesting things tonight because he was also in charge of the Malaysian <coughs> Electoral Role Analysis Project. And finally, we have Tommy Thomas, who has been a prominent writer on legal and constitutional matters, a lawyer. And in the middle, we have the moderator for the evening, a um, colleague from Institute Rakyat, Research Director, Ian Shalom. And Shalom, over to you. He's going to conduct this in a talk, a discussion, dialogue style. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tricia. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for braving the rain and the traffic uh, and possibly competing to Ramos to be with us tonight. We are going to run this evening a bit like a news panel. We're not going to have the one by one uh, list of speakers uh, because we have a lot of experts here and a lot of overlapping uh, specialties. And so my job as moderator tonight will be to roll out a couple of important questions to our panel and then I'll throw it over to you, the voters, to ask your questions of them. So this is a this is a night where you can allow your geekiness or nerdiness about elections to run rampant. You can ask all the questions, uh, to pick the knowledge of the panel here. They are at your disposal. Please take full advantage of them. In terms of the topics that we'll go through to tonight, we will start sequentially with the dissolution of parliament, through to the ins and outs of the campaigning period, what happens on voting day and immediately, immediately beyond uh, once the votes are counted and the winners and losers are decided. Parliament was dissolved on April 3rd. The Election Commission 
met yesterday, April 10th, and they announced that the nomination date for candidates for the coming general election will be on April 20th. And 15 days later, 15 day campaign period, we will have the general elections on May the 5th, on a Sunday. Now, modern democracy isn't only about elections, but elections are a fundamental aspect of what makes a democracy work. It's what allows our democracy to be called a representative or parliamentary democracy. We, the people, the voters, get to cast our votes and elect who represents us in the highest seats of government. And therefore, it's also our power as electors to evict the government every election. And if they've done a good job, they can stay employed. If not, they get sacked and they have to find new employment. Right? That is your power as the bosses of the government. <coughs> and so, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's consider the words of Election Commission Chairman Abdul Aziz Yusuf, who at the meeting yesterday said that he disagrees that this election will be the dirtiest. We have put in place so many changes. So we hope that it will be the best election ever held. And with that in mind, let's turn to our panel and see what they have to say. We're going to start with Tommy Thomas here on my left, who is a constitutional expert. And we're going to discuss the issue of caretaker government. Right? Tommy has written quite a few articles. Um, I think he, he started the gun early uh, in March, talking about what a caretaker government meant. Um, so how should it behave? Um, what are the international standards? Where does Malaysia you know, stand within that? Yeah, I think essentially uh, the starting point is to appreciate that the concept of a caretaker government is not so much derived from the law, because a lot of people have asked, uh, is it a, uh, what is the law governing it? And the reason is it's steeped and derives from politics. It is a political science doctrine which has sort of been around for about 70, 80 years. And like in most doctrines originated in Europe, in systems, and if I, if I take the UK as an example, uh, in a system where elections uh, can result in a change of government. I say that because in Malaysia for 56 years, until this election, when hopefully there will be a change of government, for 56 years, we've had one continuous party or coalition of parties running the country. So in that context, caretaker government does not mean anything because there is no change of government. So in order to understand the concept of a caretaker government, you must picture a system where change is possible and the elections are all about a change happening. So if you take the, the 20th century, a British model by the, if you look at the 1920s, 1930s and the Second World War, you had the Conservative Party, Labour Party and then the Coalition. There was change of government nearly all the time. So that's when they realised that between the, the dissolution of Parliament and the elections, and there's always a time lag, uh, in civilised countries it will be four to six weeks, mature countries six, six weeks to two months. In Malaysia, of course, they traditionally keep it very short. Although this year, because of the nervous prime minister, by default, we've had a longer period. So it's to cater for that interim period between dissolution or calling or the end of one parliamentary life and the election date. And, it, and it's a short period between four to six weeks. And it's really what is to happen to the country uh, in those four to six weeks when the attention of the whole population is to the general election. And the idea is, look, the government is campaigning because the existing government wants to be re-elected uh, and they are facing the opposition and a, a real change is possible. But at the same time, a, co a country needs a government. And, I, and essentially when you think about it, actually maybe not. Because when you, when, you, when, you, when you fundamentally think about it, why does a country need a government for six, four, four to six weeks unless there is a war? And in Malaysia, even when you have a war, a so-called invasion, 
uh, the government that doesn't do anything. So actually, the, the emphasis of a government is exaggerated. Um, and, in, in, uh, and if you take uh, the English model, for example, in this caretaker interim period, all the ministers would be busily campaigning because they want to be re-elected. So would the opposition. And that's what happens in, happens in Malaysia. Um, uh, if you are an MIC minister or an MCA minister or an UMNO minister, it, at this period, you're fighting for your political survival. You are expected to be re-elected, not to run the government. So who runs the government in that interim period? Well, technically, the civil servants, uh, on the assumption that the government needs to be run. Um, and if you, if you question that, the government actually doesn't need to be run, because life goes on, the sun continues to shine, and the birds sing, and the trees are there. So sometimes it's exaggerated. Um, and uh, countries like Italy, which has problems about coalition building post-elections, go for months without governments, till they really find a working government. And they are still run there. Italy, Italy is not invaded. Italy, uh, life goes on. So, so, uh, so that's, that's essentially, I don't want to go on. So that's okay. essentially uh, the, the caretaker government. That it is a temporary measure while people are campaigning. Everybody is supposed to be campaigning. Then what, what, are, your, <laughs> what are your thoughts on how the incumbent uh, caretaker government should conduct itself uh, during that period? Then? How should it end? Well, because, the, because the, their primary role, again, is to equalize the campaigning position so that they are freed from governmental duties and freed from bureaucratic politics so that they can go back to their constituencies and campaign. The idea is very little ought to be done at the governmental level. They certainly cannot be making major policy decisions. And in fact, of course, parliament is in recess. There is no parliament. Parliament has been dissolved. So even their parliamentary duties end. And therefore, they are really, nothing really is supposed to happen. And certainly not what's been happening in Malaysia. So if I just look at the Berse uh, pamphlet, press statement which came out this morning. So I, I forgot that if, if I just give an example that stands out uh, on the 5th of April, and I think the dissolution was on the 3rd of April, isn't it? Yes. So 3rd of April, so this is 5th of April, uh, Prime Minister Najib, should we caretaker Prime Minister Najib, announced new projects in Cyber JR totaling almost $8 billion. The projects are a 6 billion Cyber JR city centre, a 600 million environmentally friendly mosque and a 1.2 billion mixed development project. That is absolutely not the task of a caretaker government. They had five years to announce this. Why did they not announce it five, in the last five years? And anyway, what makes you think that you will re you'll be returned by the people so that you can carry out this promise? Mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the assurance that a new government may just ignore that? So if I, when I give you a real example like this, it tells you <coughs> why a caretaker prime minister and a caretaker government should not be undertaking a major project like eight billion, uh, 6 billion cyber jaya. A classic extreme example. Okay. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, we'll try the other one. And I'll treat that one afterwards. Okay, so thank you, Tommy. Uh, let's turn to why we live with Wong now, since she actually is a living example of a caretaker uh, government figure right next to us. Um, I believe the Salango government was probably the first one uh, in Malaysia, or at least the first one in this election, to announce some kind of care caretaker guidelines. Uh, what does it mean? Does it mean you're all now carrying brooms or, or what? Uh, what does it mean to, and, and what effect have, have you put into caretaker governments? Just to perhaps, I'm not going to dispute or, or come to what uh, Tom said earlier, um, <coughs> but this is more practical. So we, we back in February, we had already made a decision to study what entails, uh, what are the responsibilities and what are the limitations of a caretaker government. So, in, at the end of the day, we had this very thick document, which was sent out 19th of February, so way in advance. 
um, and it's the first circular of the Slango um, State Secretary Office um, to all. So it's not just to the politicians, but also to the head of departments, um, the, the civil servants, uh, what we can do and what we can't do, what they can do and what they can't do. So essentially, I think most people would know what are the limitations, but I'll just run through it. Uh, one is that we don't have EXCO meetings anymore. So EXCO is like the state level cabinet. So we don't have that because we don't make new policy decisions. We don't sign major contracts. Um, we don't take up new major um, development projects after the solution. We cannot spend money after, unless it's already approved prior to the solution, we cannot spend money that's currently in our accounts. So, and what we've done in Slango is that we have taken a step further <coughs> because of our experience when we came in in 2008, um, we found out that, for example, there were lots of development projects uh, which were done during elections but never approved and then people came knocking on our doors asking us to pay. You know, for example, carrying of roads and this and that. This went on in Slango during the last elections. Then the state assemblymen, who at that time had about half a million um, worth of, um, we call it Perduka, it's the budget there, so they spent it all, all 500,000. So, and in 2008, the elections finished March 8th, so they already finished all, their, all the available money. So what we did this time is that we put limits to it. So we just, we can only spend, up to 50% of our allocation. Uh, I'm an EXCO member, I have a certain amount of money uh, for projects, statewide projects, and we also have limitations, 50%. That means I can only use so much. So this is a little extra that we had, um, just to make sure that uh, the new government, when the new government comes in, the, there's enough money to continue, you don't have to ask for extra money. Then of course the usual stuff like uh, we're not supposed to use our official cars when we're campaigning, things like that. Um, you know, my for example, I have a driver, but you know when we're campaigning, I have to pay for his um, salary or his overtime. But of course these are not listed down, but these are just common sense stuff that I think everyone should do. Um, so when I came here, I actually had a long debate. Um, just to tell you, so I had a long debate with my driver. So, this is an official program, I'm representing the state. So, ideally I should come in an official car. And I shouldn't be wearing my party clothes. Um, but then I realized it's very cumbersome for me to go and get my official car. Especially in this rain. So I said, okay, I will take my campaign car, which has all the Kamila and you know, my big face. It's very bright and gaudy. But that's campaigning. Well, I'm here in my capacity as uh, you know, member of CAT and CAT Expo. And I realized that my bicycle cannot get me here, it's a bit far, because I don't own a car. So I tried to call my brother in the end. So I gave up all that and I came in my campaign car. So please don't knock me before that. I had no choice. Um, but these are things that, you know, that's interesting that we are now starting to think. I mean, I think in the past, it would be like, you know, we can use a campaign car, so we can use the state officers to our heart's content, um, and no one would say anything. But now there's a lot more scrutiny by uh, the public, the NGOs, and it's also the first time that these things are coming out. I think in the past, uh, with the exception of past, uh, in Kelantan as well as Trungan for one term, I don't think we ever had this opportunity to study what exactly is a caretaker government or what would be the details or what are the things that we actually debated in Expo, what should go into this circular. So that's our little contribution. Is it legally binding? No. If you go through it, which I did very quickly just now, most of the words just said has to be avoided. Um, you know, <coughs> Signing contracts should be, major contracts should be avoided. Um, uh, you know, campaigning during you know, your official duties should be avoided. 
it does not say that if you do it, you'll be penalized. So there's no provision for that. Whether we should have it in Malaysia in the future, I'm not really sure. But these are the general guidelines that we go through. Whether there's a need for a caretaker government, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, because since the solution um, a week ago, <laughs> we haven't done, well, I haven't done much. Um, I've gone to officiate uh, the Malaysian Women's Marathon, which is a big thing for me. Uh, and we thought that by that time, uh, the marathon would be held, election would have been held. But that didn't happen, so we went there and gave prizes. So you know, it's fine. Um, I went for a couple of meetings. Um, but no policy decision, no new decisions were made. And this morning, and, and this was all done in advance, it was already decided in advance. Um, I took a group of people to look at compost and worms. So it's not very exciting. I'm not giving up money, unfortunately. I don't think the media <laughs> will pick up on that. So, and most of the expos, actually, if you notice, uh, they have not been doing much of the so-called expo or government work. A lot of it is actually campaigning to a certain extent, uh, with the exception of our country, because he does have certain obligations and he has already set his schedule, usually a month or two in advance. So, so the things that he has to do. But apart from that, right now, there's no major disaster. So we don't have to make any decisions. But in the event, okay, let's make, let's have this, um, you know, let's make this assumption. In the event, you know, there's some nuclear power plant that's built in Slayer, for example, it, it leaks, and we have to come together, we have to make major decisions. Possibly, money is involved to repair and things like that. That part, that's where the caretaker government comes in and it plays a role. And we cannot actually make major decisions, major expenditure decisions, without calling the opposition. So this is actually written down. And I think this is also part of the, the convention of caretakers. So if there's anything you know, major and I assume disasters, that's when they come in together with the opposition and then they come to an agreement and we implement it. Apart from that, the government is, is, is just moving on its own. So local council issues, uh, drainage, there's some places that were flooded, for example, in my area yesterday, and the council kicks in. They do their own job. You don't need politicians or state governments to tell them what to do and when to do. Um, you know, bills are being paid, um, you know, things are moving on. So there are two, although the parliament has been dissolved, the state assembly has been, has been dissolved, there's actually two entities that are still um, in existence, meaning that they have not been dissolved or they, they have not been told to step aside. One local councillors, because they are appointed uh, using a different role. So they will, they will go on with their jobs. They will still have their meetings, but usually they are busy campaigning. <coughs> Second, a local village, what we call JKKK, Jaltan Kwasa Keselamatan. Tampo, Jawatan Kuasa Tampo, Keselamatan, dan Kemajuan. So, again, they are appointed and they have a certain lifespan, they have a contract. So, that still goes on. And there's also a few contract, we call them contract workers, or, you know, like task force. Task force of Felda, we have a special task force. <coughs> it ends in June and it goes on. Uh, whatever work they're doing, then it goes on. So that does not uh, actually have any bearing on whether the state assembly has been dissolved or not. GLC still go on, of course. Government link companies still go on. So this is just a little bit about that. Okay. So maybe you can ask yeah. questions. Thank you. Um, I understand there's been some criticism from Bursa that came out today as oh, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they... <coughs> They published some uh, caretaker guidelines, which I think Dr. Farouk will uh, touch on a bit later. Um, but Bursa has also come out with some criticism directed towards both the federal government, run by Barroso National, and the Slango government, run by Manata Matya. And this involves the, the caretaker conduct. And 
Specifically, let me direct this to you, uh, Wabi Elizabeth. They've, uh, they've alleged, I think Irene, Irene is here, I don't know if she wants to take this up afterwards as well, but um, the federal parliament dissolved on April 3rd, the Solano State Assembly dissolved on April 4th, and uh, Bursi has said that on April 4th, the Solano Chief Minister, Nancy Kalo Ibrahim, announced a 300 million bonus for Solano civil servants, uh, although they say this is one day after the dissolution of the federal parliament. Um, and then on April 5th, they state that the Slango State Government announced an initial allocation of uh, nearly two and a half million for the neighborhood safety program uh, in order to reduce crime in rural areas. And I think there's a third point from uh, Bistari Jaya, uh, villages of Bistari Jaya have been given land titles uh, by the Chief Minister, uh, which was promised uh, some time ago. Okay, thanks. Good, good. I'm glad this came up. That's how I publicized tonight's. Or my sister come and hear me explain. <laughs> but just to put the facts right, sorry, Nairi, because I think you were at the press conference and I had a bit of a SMS tiff with a few of your proceedings, but uh, we shall be cordial here. Um, what happened was that we dissolved Parliament, we announced the dissolution of the Parliament about 4 4 30. And the first allegation by Bursi, which was that we announced a 300 bonus um, after the dissolution, that's not true. Actually, we made the decision to give a 300 bonus, 300 ringgit bonus. And it's not really a bonus. You know, we're putting it in the Kabo Haji savings account and a regular savings account. What happened was that we were not actually there to announce, we were there for the dissolution, to make public the dissolution. But, uh, Tan Sri Khalid, our caretaker, Matri Basa, was asked a very interesting question. He said, uh, he was asked, how do you rate your EXCO members by uh, one member of the media? You can actually, I think there's also a video of that. So Tan Sri Khalid said, well, I'm giving them 300 ringgit bonus. So that's how, he's, how he rates us. So after five years of fantastic service to the state, we get 300 ringgit bonus. So that came about, there wasn't really an announcement, that was answering the question that was put up by uh, one of the media, members of the media. The second thing, uh, which actually I announced it, and it's not true, it's not April 5th, but I think the news came out on April 5th. Uh, it was announced prior to the solution. And this is one thing, at least for me personally, I made sure that any announcement has to be done before the solution. And I only called two media, which is Lango Kini, Lango Times, and I said, look, we've made this decision, which is to have to set up community policing at the village level, at the JKKK level. So I'm not sure when that came up because I didn't track that. But because of this thing, what I did was I checked uh, my phone log and my message log, so it corresponds with what I thought was correct, which is I gave the statement prior to the solution. As for the statement that our Muntri Basar, where is this? Muntri Basar said that he will assist those who cannot afford to pay premium for titles. This is actually a policy that was made in 2010. And this is something that we go around the whole state. Every time we give land titles, we give them options. One is that they can pay full premium and we give them automatic 30% discount. If, and oftentimes, you know, this happens at the village level, most of them cannot afford to pay full premium, we give them an option to pay 1,000 ringgit premium. And if they cannot pay that 1,000 ringgit, then we give them an option to work out some kind of uh, um, exchange, meaning that if they work on voluntary community projects, charity projects, then they don't have to pay that 1,000 ringgit. So this is something that we've been announcing all over the state. Sometimes when we drama outside the announcement, outside the state as well, um, since 2010. So it's not something new, And but I understand uh, because I, it was interesting. This evening I had a discussion, a quick discussion with Sivarasa. You know, what is black, what is white, and what is grey? And for him, he said, this is a bit grey, this is a bit dicey, because even though it's an old policy, um, and probably no one ever noticed or reported it, uh, for the past three years. But, you know, maybe the, 
that need not have come up. So I think there's something for us to to think about further. So no, I think that that's correct. I, I, I would really agree. Really. Yeah, but it, I think I think it's good that people are thinking about this. I think that's more important rather than you know from the few statements I've read from the federal government, which is like uh, you know there's nothing wrong. We can continue doing what we do. Things like that. Um, I think we are very cautious, uh, more so because there's still a lot of scrutiny. And we are sensitive and we are responsive to the scrutiny because we want to make government uh, administration more transparent, more accountable. I think that's our bottom line. I mean, if we didn't care, then we would just do a lot of funny things that we have seen uh, previously or in the past few days. But I think we are very careful and then we continue to discuss amongst ourselves. Is that is that alright to do it? Is it alright to announce this or maybe we shouldn't do it? Let's just go and campaign all out and forget about you know, government work. So but I, I, I would attribute this extra caution and I think awareness, um, especially to per se and also other NGOs. I think that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Thank you. Um, actually, that raises an interesting point. I'll throw it out to the rest of the panel as well. Do you, do you feel that the current conditions that we're in, where we have more evenly matched political opponents on the national level, in Parliament, in states, has that actually made accountability uh, you know, more, more important? Has, has it raised the level of quality of accountability? Dr. Perfect. The accountability that politicians have to think through, that they actually do have to spend more time now, since 2008, thinking about are we behaving correctly? Are we behaving not just according to the law, but are we behaving according to expectation and ethics? Well, All right, thank you. Uh, I think um, if you're talking uh, uh, in the year 2013, right, I guess that uh, basically uh, Malaysians as a whole they are more aware of their rights and they are more aware of the need for you know for a clean and fair action and for accountability on both sides whether the opposition or even the government of the day and uh, i think this is very important in, in many issues especially when especially when uh, when we propose uh, to the government um, i guess uh, it was the November 2011, when we sent a report to the Parliamentary Select Committee um, demanding for a free, fair and clean election. And um, why is it so important? Because we believe that you know, this is basically uh, uh, in line with uh, what the values uh, of uh, a true democracy is all about. So, the Prime Minister himself Claim that Malaysia is basically uh, <coughs> the best democracy in the world. <laughs> right? He claimed that <laughs> Malaysia is the best democracy in the world. But then, if you look at the democracy index, 2012, the latest democracy index that divided uh, countries into four categories to fall uh, full democracy uh, down to uh, an authoritarian regime. And Malaysia falls into uh, fraud, democracy. So how could he claim that? How could he substantiate his claim? I, I mean, it, it, this, this is uh, uh, a real problem. And in fact, uh, you know, there, there are so many things like we demanded, like all of us are aware of the eight demands of Versailles, for example, for uh, free and fair election. But unfortunately, until today, the only claim that they agreed upon, agreed upon, which is not implemented, agreed upon, was only the first claim about indelible ink. And, and it's very sad. It's very sad. The government, which claims to be the best, to have the best democracy in the world, is, doesn't pay any, uh, does not pay any heed to uh, free and fair election. And they want to be known to be the best democracy. So there's a flaw in this argument. Like we have to be very critical about it and similarly, we don't want the opposition uh, 
tea, for example, right? Whenever like the a tea power, true democratic means, especially the past led state, for example, we don't want them to kind of uh, to say that okay. The dictum that people used to say, one man, one vote, one time. You know, like what happened in Kedah, for example, was you know a, a disaster. To say that to pass an enactment that says that you know a, muf, a fatwa by a mufti cannot be challenged in court of law was <coughs> undemocratic, right? And we cannot we cannot say that it is a right because it is a past government. No, we have to say that we will not condone such an act, whether it's from the government or whether it's from the opposition. We must be clear about that. We must value democracy, and that is the most important part of all. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, well, actually, since you brought up the, the demands of of Berse, um, you know, Berse has been campaigning for the last five years, and it's put out these eight demands, which are <coughs> number one. Clean the electoral roll. Number two, reform postal ballots. Number three, use of indelible ink. Number four, a minimum 21 days campaigning period. Number five, free and fair access to the media. Number six, strengthen public institutions. Number seven, stop corruption. Number eight, stop dirty politics. So, what's what's Berse's assessment of where things stand now? How free and fair are is our election system? How far have we come? Uh, well, to be honest, uh, uh, there is no level playing field in our country, to be honest, right? We have had like, uh, uh, several uh, general elections before this, uh, and uh, you know, like, uh, uh, everything is good just on paper, right? <laughs> Even our demand for an international observer was not met, right? Why are they so scared about international observers? They are not coming here to, you know, to infringe on, on or to try and dictate what, you know, the system that we uh, try to implement in our country. But they're trying to observe the democratic process that we have been so proud of, right? And this is a, a, a norm in all uh, democracies in the world. And yet we want to be an abandoned country, you know, not to accept international observers to come and in fact uh, sent back one uh, Australian uh, senator when he came here just you know for uh, to observe our, our, our situation in this country and, and, and that's, that's very undemocratic and you know and um, a very uncivilized act for a government of Malaysia to behave like that and I would like to stress on this uh, this uh, issue about uh, free access to media, especially, I don't think that you know, like giving uh, uh, ten minutes to the opposition, and you can have two hours to explain about your manifesto, is basically a level playing field. It's ridiculous, right? How could you give ten minutes to the opposition parties to to explain about their manifesto, and you have all the time in the world? Day in and day out, day and night, to explain about, about your agenda. And uh, you spend millions of dollars, in fact, last month, if I'm not mistaken, you spent millions of dollars to advertise millions of taxpayers' money, not from, you know, not from wife, his wife, or, you know, but from taxpayers' money. Right? So, I mean, how could that be? Tolerant. It, this is totally ridiculous. Yeah. Thank you. Do you, do you want to cover some more of the points that uh, we've loaded up to your slides here? Uh, do you want to talk through them or you would prefer to talk? No, I have to discuss like this. Okay. 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 Um, so, uh, going back to the Parliamentary Select Committee, what's, what's your review of the Parliamentary Select Committee process? How did, I mean, to, to explain the benefit of those of us who maybe don't remember so well, uh, how did it come about uh, as a response to Berset? Uh, what, what did it really achieve? And 
was it a uh, was it a genuine process? Was it a whitewash? What was it? Uh, I think I go. I think I go to my slides. Go to uh, do you go change the one? Change the one. Yeah. Okay. Um, what is important is that is uh, you know we want to um, try and say that there must be an establishment of a clear legal framework. Okay, which sets a limit on the EC's discretionary and refining provisions of the existing statutory and constitutional powers uh, to shield the EC from the influence of and interference from the ruling body. So the problem now is that EC is not seen to be independent. Right? So what we say that in order EC must be independent and it must be free from intervention from the Prime Minister itself. Next one, please. So the Chairman and the members of the EC must be appointed by an independent parliamentary select committee. Right? And they must be taken into consideration only if they have demonstrated embellished, um, em unblemished characters independent, impartial, and sound judgment, and strict adherence to the provisions of the Constitution. So based, if you look at the Indian uh, Electoral Commission, which is considered as the best in the world, we would say that the chairman should be a retired or serving federal court judge, and not a civil servant, like now, right? And it must be conducted with full transparency. Next. They must not be immune. Okay? And they must be accountable for their acts. Next. And they must have uh, their own budget. Alright? So that they can conduct um, their whatever project that they wanted to do. Yep. Next. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go as fast as possible. Okay, the EC must also be given powers to play this role in ensuring that political parties desist uh, from discriminatory and divisive politics based on gender, ethnicity, race and religion through a code of conduct. And it is very important because we have seen and for the past year or so, like, you know, nothing has been observed regarding this. And you know, it's going to get worse when it's uh, coming nearer to election. Next one, please. And this is also very important about this uh, delimitation of constituencies because we know that, I think uh, Mr. Ong Keming uh, will mention about this a little bit about uh, gerrymandering that's, uh, that's going on in, uh, in our constituencies, right? And. Uh, and I would like to say this again about the equal media access. Okay, this is a very important point, and this is very lacking in our country. Equal media access. You know, we, I mean, many of us, like we have, we have stayed overseas, and we have seen that even the opposition parties can get into the uh, national TV. I think just to put a bit of historical context to what you're saying, yeah. uh, if I remember correctly, Okay, so this year the Information and Culture Minister, uh, Dr. Rice Yatin, has said that the opposition parties have 10 minutes of TV time. Yeah. And this actually represents a 100% increase from the last time, which is 5 minutes. <laughs> I think that's correct, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. No, it's a big deal. So there's progress on the other side is 23 hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> and why, the reason why we won the 21 days, it's on this. 21 days is that we give everyone, every party, adequate time to explain their manifesto to the people, right, to the riot, right. Throughout the year, you know, we have seen on TV3, TV1, TV2, and all kind of TVs, you know, like, the government has been explaining and has, has been propagating their agenda. Now is the time for people to, to listen to the opposition to listen to the other side of the story. And, uh, you know, they must be open to, to uh, the reason 
the problem uh, with our country is that the access, the internet access, for example, for for uh, what we call uh, independent news, the internet access is uh, 85 percent in uh, urban area, according to I think data center. Right? Yeah, it was just I think 15 percent in rural areas. And Malaysian Kimi until today, I, I believe the Malaysian Kimi uh, videography is here. Malaysian Kimi has been denied to publish their a print uh, newsletter to be distributed to the rural areas. And until today, so you know, like the government is trying to restrict the information to the public, and this is very bad for democracy. The the campaign period in 2008 was actually only, I think, 13 days. Yeah. Now uh, it hasn't increased by 100%. It's only gone up by two days to 15 days. Um, we've got two politicians in the panel. Uh, can I ask you how you feel, you and your parties feel, about whether this is enough? Then I'll ask Jose uh, how they feel about that. Is, is 15 days enough to get your message out? Uh, I think if it's just for campaigning purposes, you can make the argument that two weeks or 15 days uh, would be somewhat fair. Uh, uh, so short set of uh, seven days compared to, what, uh, 21, compared to the 21 days that per se asked for. But my concern is uh, something that goes beyond campaigning. Uh, my concern is given the fact that the election commission is trying to establish and put in place a lot of new things that has not done before. Things like advanced voting, things like overseas voting, uh, which we have seen that uh, the election commission has already uh, uh, screwed up uh, in a sense by because its website crashed on the day that uh, parliament was dissolved. So many people who wanted to download the necessary forms and instructions to apply to become uh, overseas postal voters were denied that opportunity. So that is actually what I'm uh, concerned about. It's not just a matter of campaigning, but also a matter of whether the election commission uh, has given itself enough time to make sure that we can have a really efficient uh, and, and um, a fair uh, campaign during that, that two week period. Thank you. It's, for me, it's not about whether it's 14 days or 21 days. It's about whether we have the political will to set a date for elections. I think once you have a date set, Hopefully this can be done by the new government. Then everyone would work out their schedules. And they will work out when the actual campaign time would be. And you don't need to have SPR being the arbiter, say that, oh, there's nominations and like that. So I want to look at it differently. Because 21 days is never enough. I mean, let's... Okay, we are living... Most of the people here probably live in PJKL. You have access to the internet. You, you know, you probably you know, have a lot of like-minded friends. You come to forums like this, but this is Klang Valley. We are talking about the rest of the country. Three weeks is not enough because for 365 days, over five years, 24 hours, the opposition has had no access to here except for bad news or you know, fitna, uh, libelous news. So can we, you know, change their minds in two weeks, three weeks? I doubt that very much. So obviously I would actually prefer a one-year campaign period. Yes, I mean this is what happens in the US, of course that's presidential, yeah. but they know that after uh, three, four years, four years, that's when they have to do all their work, policy work, implementation, and the last year is just campaign. And that's what we should be aiming for. So you, you'd be in favour of something like the US system of fixed term, yeah. uh, fixed elections, so there's predictability, so every four or five years yeah. there's I, always a clear election date. Because I, I think this general election has shown that it is really, it, it's not good for the country to be guessing. For the, it's not for the past three months, it's for the past one and a half years. Ka'adilan has been ready for general elections since July 20. Yeah, we have been told to, to get ready since 2011. So can you imagine we are we have done so many dramas 
<laughs> my residents are so sick of me, they say, you don't have to come down anymore. <laughs> it's okay, you don't have to come to this Masa Malam. <laughs> so you want to help your All right. Um, me. <coughs> Can I say something with the media? Since we, uh, since, uh, we started about the caretaker government, now that is an, ex an example of, of an area where the caretaker <coughs> uh, minister of information in any country, uh, if he has such power as, we ha as the information minister in Malaysia has, he should ref uh, refrain from using it. Just to remind you, the, the television, whether it's RTM, TV3 or whatever, is funded by taxpayers' money. It's consolidated fund money. All of us in this room who pay tax, uh, about, about 2 or 3, 3%, three percent, 2 3 percent of the national budget goes to that propaganda ministry, the information ministry, which even Goebbels would be very impressed with. So you have the information ministry with awesome powers uh, controlling radio and television. And then you look at the newspapers, the mainstream newspapers, you have the licensing once a year, KDN and whatever that you know about, and then the ownership of newspapers. So what Elizabeth said is correct. For uh, five years, just taking this election as an example, for five years, the country is used to this kind of propaganda. It's absolutely propaganda. One-way traffic. And then to say, in the caretaker period, even if you open it up for 24 hours, seven days a week, and open up the New Straight Times and the Star and all the others, and Utusan, uh, Utusan, that newspaper of truth and fairness, if you, open, if you do all that, you still cannot uh, achieve equality. So that is how squared our system is. Our system is so squared, which is why only a person who is delusional can describe this system as the world's greatest democracy. <laughs> because it all depends, as, as they said in Alice in Wonderland, it depends what you mean. So his idea of democracy, obviously, differs from the right thinking members' uh, definition. So his idea of democracy is control, news control, what George Orwell said. So to me, it is a real myth to talk about media because we, we just cannot get it. And so one of the great things about this election, and you must give credit to the NGOs, the opposition parties, the Bursay, all this, and the Malaysians waking up, the striking feature, if there is somebody coming, a foreigner coming to Malaysia, he is going to say, look, I cannot believe that Malaysians can now not believe this propaganda and reject it. Because don't forget, in the popular vote, and we know that, we, we, you know, I'm confident there'll be a new government. I mean, I'm confident that uh, Najib, I, and I say this, I say that publicly, Najib, Najib Razak was the Prime Minister, now he's the caretaker Prime Minister, in 24 days he'll be the ex-Prime Minister. I'm confident that's going to happen because the people of Malaysia will, will do that, will, will say that, will vote that way. But if the popular vote, it'll be, it'll be interesting, if you look at the popular vote which no doubt will be developing, if there are 13.3 13 million voters, and let's say 11 million people vote <coughs> on an 80% turnout, 11 million people voting, I, if the popular vote comes to about 60% to Pakatan, 60-40, then the striking feature, uh, feature uh, the, 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 the comment that a foreigner can say is, I am stunned that 50 to 60% of Malaysians can think for themselves and reject government propaganda because you are not on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine for a minute you have a level playing field, BBC English style? Can you imagine for a minute the popular vote will be 90% to Pakata? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to mention uh, my last part. About <laughs> this, uh, Please go ahead. Uh, I guess this is a very important, important point about this code of conduct. You know, like, if you look, uh, I mean, I mean, if you were to watch YouTube, for example, you will see that you know while, well, I'm not saying Pakatan, I'm not going to the opposition, right? They talk about policy, right? But look at the government, their their dramas and everything. The government, the government talks about 
pornography. So, you know, this, you know, one side talks about policy, this is what we're going to say, what we're going to do, what we have for the people. The other side is trying to, you know, make up stories about what happened in the bedroom and things like that. So this is ridiculous, you know, you are not educating the people about, about democracy, about good governance, about what we need in the country to prosper, about the economic policy. Right? What you have when you want to come up with the economic policy is that you have <coughs> copy and paste from the others. And this is, this is not good, right? You have to come up with your, you know, your idea, what is, what is your agenda in your, in your economic policy. We want to know your agenda. That's the most important thing. We want to know whether you subscribe to the neoliberal agenda or you are more concerned with the socialist agenda, for example. Right? But where is, where, where is I mean, the debate going on? It's, it's not leading to nowhere. So this is very important for us. And, you know, this, this code of conduct of um, uh, politicians uh, during this period, before election, is very, very important. So the really the, the three like the, the three kind of P's for this election right now are policy, pornography, and photocopy. <laughs> Good one. Good one. Come on. The okay. Do you, do you want to say a bit, uh, a bit more about how per se derived its code of conduct? Because I understand you, you drew from several sources yeah. to put it together. Do you want to say something about that? Well. Um, well, to be, to be honest, uh, we prepared this 38-page, uh, uh, what we call as uh, um, Making Clean, Free and Fair Elections work towards an independent, impartial and transparent election commission in Malaysia. And I guess, like, you know, like, it's going to be uh, troublesome for me to go through all that, but what is important is that we have to subscribe to the world standard. Okay? We have to subscribe to the best standard in the world about this uh, conduct. And I guess that you know, the most important part and the highest uh, how do I say, conduct in uh, having a debate for election is what has been proposed by Dr. Amiga recently, uh, I guess today or yesterday, that Berse is going to organize a debate between Dr. Siano Ibrahim and Najib. And Dr. Siano Ibrahim has replied and agreed to attend, but we are still waiting for Najib <laughs> to reply to us. Yeah, it will be, be conducted on the 27th, if I'm not mistaken. 17th, yeah, 17th of, of, of uh, this month. And uh, ARSCH, uh, Kuala Lumpur Chinese Center. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Our chairman of Workouts? Astro or anybody? Well, we hope so. We don't know whether he'll be attending or not. Uh, we know him. You know, like, he might ask someone else to, to represent him. And um, um, from our last meeting, I was supposed to chair the session to be the moderator for the debate. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, well, let's look forward to that. I think it'll be a big step for the nation.